So why did Ben actually choose to go on Malaysian Airlines? Why that flight? Very simple costs. Um, I can remember he asked me, oh, how do I go about getting the flight tickets? He came home and I said, well, yeah, they've worked out that the cheapest way of getting to Perth, and don't forget, he was a student looking after his money, um, was to go from Bristol Airport to Amsterdam, and then on to Malaysia, and then on to Perth. And so it was purely for that reason. And we never gave any thought to flight paths or alternative routes. It was purely that was the cheapest option, and that's what he went for. And then you all went to see him off, you saw him off at Bristol Airport? He was just so excited, even though it was an unearthly hour. Um, he just wanted to get on with it. And we got to Bristol Airport, and we sorted out his tickets, and... Uh, I think his mum would have quite liked to have had a last minute cup of coffee with him before going off, but I could see that he was just so impatient that he just wanted to get off into the uh, departures lounge. And so we said our goodbyes, we had a hug, and, and that was it. We watched him go off into departures, and, and that was it. We never saw him again. So tell me then what happened, the sequence of what happened. How did you find out about the crash? It was on the uh, BBC Breaking News, uh, Malaysian flight had crashed, and I just knew in that second that it was his. Even though I couldn't quite, re quite recall the, uh, the flight number, I just knew immediately that it was his flight. I was told that his plane had been shot down over Ukraine, um, and just in my kind of head I was thinking, well there's probably a crash landing, and you know, there might have been a fire, but Ben's young and fit, so of all the people on the flight, I was thinking, oh, he's probably someone that could have got out. And it wasn't until I walked past the lounge and saw um, the footage of the crash site that I actually realised what had happened and that, that Ben wasn't coming home, basically. And at what stage did you have any idea of what might have happened? I mean, you knew a plane had presumably been shot down, but you weren't absolutely sure of what had happened. And nor are you, of course, still sure because nobody knows yet. I think we knew from what relations said to us in the early days that, it, that there, a missile was involved. Um, obviously, it wasn't something that I could immediately deal with in the first few days. It was just that the plane had crashed and that was it. As a family, then you, had, you presumably had to decide how you were going to deal with this. And one of the ways to deal with it was to actually get involved and go to Holland. We were able to join all the other families out on the tarmac when the two big airplanes came in. And so we watched all the coffins being offloaded to planes. As the uh, coffins were loaded onto the hearse, and the hearse then started driving by, a couple of ladies then started wailing. And then at that moment, you really sense how bad this was. Now, the Dutch have started a process of reconstruction as well as a criminal investigation. So what do you hope from the reconstruction process? First thing that we have to establish is how would that plane brought down? Was it brought down by an air, a ground-to-air missile or was there another aircraft involved? If we can, for example, establish it with a ground-to-air missile, and I believe that this is something that the reconstruction of the aircraft will prove, then the next question will be, who fired that missile? Who gave the order for it? So what's the response of the Ukrainians been like? One of the questions that the Ukrainians have to answer is, why were they allowing passenger airline to fly in that particular airspace? I, I believe that Eurocontrol, who are responsible for monitoring flight paths recommended to the Ukrainians several days before that that flight space should be closed down. You were saying that you are at a different stage of grieving than some of the other families because there are families for whom there are no remains at all. Who are they? There are still families waiting for news and there are still families even though they have had an identification they can't move forward. And in fact, only a few days ago, we were informed that there are uh, another 700 fragments of human tissue or bones that have yet to be identified. 
and that's the process that's going to go on until next April or May. So um, there are a lot of families that are going to be receiving news of yet more identifications over the coming month and we may be one of them. But you decided to have the funeral, you've just had the funerals. We had the funeral because we were, or we've been fortunate, if that's the right word, in that we've been able to recover quite a lot of them. Um, but we are one of those families that will almost certainly have to go through the process of dealing with further identifications. But for you, Emily, how important was it to be in that church with everybody? Yeah, it was, I think it's been a very strange process because obviously Ben was supposed to be in Australia for six months. He wasn't supposed to be at home. So it's, we've had quite a hard time actually accepting what's happened. Um, so it wasn't really important to be able to have the chance to say goodbye. And it it's, it's gives us an opportunity to begin the process of, of moving mm -hmm. forward. And in the church, what do you remember most about your brother when you see lots of people remembering him as this kind of sporty, sports mad boy? I think just how funny and charismatic he was. Um, he was definitely a people's person um, and he had so many friends. So what has given you the strength to cope day to day? Is it faith? Is it family? Gosh, that's a good question. I think it's family. Um, We've depended on each other and we've helped each other and it's just so important at a time like this to have your family around you. But as for now, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to make the journey to Australia, am I right? We're going to visit the University of Western Australia where Ben was supposed to be studying. Um, we're going to have a tour around their campus and there's also going to be a tree planting ceremony. And we're, while we're in Sydney, we're actually going to meet with um, some nuns in northern Sydney because on the plane, Ben was sat next to an Australian nun. Um, she was known to her friends as Phil. And um, we know a little bit about her. We know she worked with schools. We know she was very um, comfortable talking with young people. So we're just gonna meet with them and find out more about her and just kind of share our experience of, of what's happened. But even if you find out who is responsible, do you accept that you might never be able to bring them to justice? Well, I take heart from Lockerbie because it took them many, many years, but ultimately they did bring somebody to justice over that. And so if they can do it, we can do it. And I'm sure we will. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you.